So the first speaker for um, this second session is Kelly Warner from the Australian Community Support Organisation. And this is looking at the expansion of family and carer support service to regional areas and implementation of additional remote service delivery mechanisms, including telephone and virtual delivery of one-on-one -on -one and group sessions. So Kelly, there you are. Hi, I'd also um, firstly like to acknowledge the tradition of custodians on the, of the land in which we meet today and pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name is Kelly Warner, I'm from the Australian Community Support Organisation and I work in the Service Development and Impact Team at AXO. Um, I'm going to talk today about the uh, evaluation of the Family Carer Support Service. So we did receive capacity building um, funding that has gone into the services that we just mentioned, but we also um, did a, a small evaluation of our existing services. Um, so the program is a support service for families and carers and significant others of people with substance use concerns in the Gippsland area of Victoria. And the theory of change is that uh, increased knowledge, confidence and skills to implement healthy coping and self-care strategies will lead to improvements in a person's health, well-being and family relationships, which in turn will lead to reductions in harms associated with substance misuse in the Gippsland area. But you have to excuse me, I'm a little bit sick, so I'm a bit breathless today. Um, so the uh, program has three components, one-on-one -on -one support, including individual and family unit counselling and brief intervention. It also uh, includes referral and advocacy for the um, family member with a substance use concern, and it's situated within our intake and referral services um, and alongside our mental health and justice programs in the region. <clears throat> we also have a closed family drug information and education support group, uh, which consists of four, three hour, uh, four sessions of three hour sessions for up to 12 participants that didn't actually run during the evaluation period. Um, and we've got a peer support program, which is an uh, open family support group designed by Shark and Family Drug Help and supported by AXO and facilitated by people with lived experience. Um, just quickly, the Gippsland region um, has a number of uh, barriers and support um, issues, such as an older population with higher levels of psychological distress, a low rate of psycho. Um, availability of psychologists in the area and half of Gibson households are classified as low income. Um, there are high rates of family violence and alcohol related family violence in some of the LGAs in the area and <coughs> overall AOD related harm. There's some riskier alcohol consumption um, higher than state average AOD related ambulance attendances, hospital admissions and alcohol related deaths in some of the LGAs and anecdotally a long wait time for AOD assessment and treatment in some areas. Um, the key evaluation questions for this uh, project was, was there an increased knowledge of the YNA, the support group content matter amongst participants who attended the groups? Was there improved health and well-being amongst those who attended support sessions? Um, is the proportion of brief intervention tasks to counselling tasks associated with improved health and well-being of participants? And was there a reduction in self-reported impact of AOD use on family members who attended the support sessions? Um, our data collection uh, included pre-post evaluation design and that had a few components. Um, First, it used existing retrospective survey data for the um, YNA groups because there weren't any groups during the evaluation period. Um, we implemented a pre and post survey um, for participants commencing in the one-on-one -on -one sessions during the evaluation period. Um, and that's been embedded into the program, so that will continue on beyond the life of this evaluation. Um, and included in this evaluation were those who had done the pre and either a review or exit measures um, during the period. We also included a focus group and interviews of participants just to get a sense of the why and the how of the data that um, we got from the surveys. And <clears throat> as you can see, it's a pretty small sample, so it's, uh, um, it's limited what kind of uh, 
findings that we've had. And there's a potential for bias with some of the, the ways in which the surveys are implemented because we wanted to embed those data collection methods into the service delivery so um, data is being collected by the program workers with participants. Um, with that in mind, um, we had some pretty good findings and um, some good uh, things to build on in the future. So the YNA groups reported increased knowledge and confidence across the domains in the materials, particularly effective communication and self-care and boundaries. Um, there was a reduction in psychological distress amongst participants. So uh, we used the K10 um, pre and mid and post for this. Um, there was also a statistically significant reduction in the frequency of difficulties experienced by family members in relation to their loved one. For that, we used um, a modified version of the uh, significant other surveys um, using the domains in that survey. Um, some other findings, there was a sign statistically significant decrease in the frequency of stress within family relationships. Um, and relationships with the substance using family member, as well as uh, frequency of incidents of family violence. Um, more participant contacts were associated with larger reduction in K10 scores and a larger reduction in the frequency of difficulties faced by family members. Other indicators um, also showed reductions in emotional distress, financial and health difficulties. Um, whilst those individual indicators improved uh, participants' overall rating of the impact of their loved one's substance use on, on their family didn't reduce significantly from the entry to three-month review, but hopefully if we continue on with the data collection, we'll see an exit point that might have reduced. Um, we didn't... Uh, frequency of legal difficulties and maintenance of social connections had no significant change at three months as part of that may have been uh, impacted by COVID. Um, and not an, there wasn't an, enough data to report on treatment engagement of the substance using family members at this point. Um, within our qualitative data, what benefits did participants report? Um, they reported reduced feelings of fear, guilt and shame, which has been a, a big theme for today. Um, participants reported that the support had diffused crisis and supported couples when relationships were stretched to breaking point. Uh, the, uh, the program had provided tangible next steps, strategies and practical support when situations became unbearable. Uh, they reported that creating firm boundaries with their loved one had reduced the frequency of them asking for material support, which had reduced stress. Uh, they reported implementation of communication strategies had reduced stress within the relationship with the loved one. Um, they, some family members have reported implementing safety measures that had reduced opportunities for threatening interactions. And um, <clears throat> most of the participants in the qualitative uh, data um, reported improved family relationships within the unit and that uh, included all those with partners reported uh, improved understanding between partners of their different responses to their family member with the substance use issue. And also among siblings, um, parents reported sharing strategies and um, communication tools with siblings of the person with a substance use concern. Um, <clears throat> some of our family members limited or ceased their loved one's access to them with support from the family care um, worker, and this was in response to family violence. We have some fairly complex clients coming through our just, justice programs, um, and part of the program helps them to, to create safe environments for families. Um, <clears throat> this quote comes from one of the participants in the focus groups who was actually being supported uh, with her partner, and they reported their whole family unit had benefited from their support. So just reaching out um, and acknowledging that they needed the support themselves um, had allowed their, all the children in their family to acknowledge the impact that, the, that um, this was having on them and also allowed them to kind of share uh, strategies within the family. So um, she said she's given us strategies so that we weren't doing that anymore. We weren't reacting. We were starting to look better, you know, instead of looking bedraggled and tired and worn out with it. We sort of gone on with our life. Um, we were thinking, you know, we'll go on holidays. We'll do this. We'll do that. So it did. It settled everybody down. So not only the communication between the substance um, using family member, but also their other adult children um, 
had, had improved with support from the program. So the implications of the findings, um, I think it given that it's a small sample, but there is evidence to suggest that the program is valuable and it's well received within uh, the, the participants um, that are supported. And the funding's up in September, like, like you know, we've, everybody said it's limited resources, so we hope that we'll be able to use some of these findings to advocate for more funding for the program in the future. Um, definitely some refinement of the outcome measures and indicators could provide more robust and informative data for future evaluations. There was definitely some, some issues with some of the measures and, and things that we've, we've learned from this process. Um, qualitative data suggests that participants value the combination of service types available and the flexibility with which they can engage in the service. Where they're able to come in and out as they require. They can step up and step down into different types of support. So someone earlier was talking about their need for kind of ongoing support and peer support because the cyclical nature of substance use issues. Um, and that's something that really came out in the qualitative data. People do really need ongoing support, whether that be through peer support or through one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and the longer duration of evaluation might see improved results. So we only really got to see um, clients, uh, participants at uh, midpoint rather than on exit of the program. And um, it will be interesting to see what the data says with more uh, time. And of course, further evaluation is needed. We weren't able to talk to some of the um, interactions between the peer support or the group programs um, and the, the importance of uh, social support and community networks for the health and wellbeing of family members. And we also weren't able to talk to the, um, the impact on the substance using family member of having their family supported. Sorry, I realise I'm over time. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, that was really interesting. Um, one of my questions was really around, um, with all you've learnt from this, um, it's kind of a common theme of sometimes engaging people into support earlier is harder. Mm. Um, were there any insights through this work around how we might work to engage people earlier in a more meaningful way? Uh, family members? Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, we were just talking about that in the break, actually. <laughs> um, we, our service is situated within an intake and referral service for treatment services in the region. So a lot of our family members are coming when they're seeking support for their family members. So um, at that crisis point that everyone's talking about. So we've tried to do community education um, and but it's been limited because AXO has had fairly stringent policies around COVID. But, um, We've done in-reach into uh, other services and also kind of community education forums. So just getting the word out, like some of our staff put pamphlets in hairdressers and you know, given the cohort we've talked about often being women, I mean, we obviously need to target men as well in, in different places, but um, they do try to get into those kind of non-traditional spaces to, to do talks to um, other service providers and also community members. They've done golf days with, um, with Relationships Australia and, and those kind of things, trying to engage more uh, community members um, that might not even know that support's available to them. But yeah, it is difficult because we tend to be attracting people at that real crisis point. Um, and, and they are really focused on the, the needs of their loved one and getting them into treatment and, and less, uh, less on their own needs, but yeah. Thank you. So there's some common themes emerging. We'll be picking them up. If you've got questions and didn't get a chance to ask them, um, grab Kelly uh, at lunch. So our next uh, presenter is Georgia Stewart. Georgia is from uh, Little Dreamers, which is working with a young carers organisation to understand the impact of the work they are doing, to evaluate their current offerings and to support development of quality improvement, um, of quality improvement. So Georgia. Um, thank you. 
Um, my name is Georgia Stewart and I'm the Regional Vic Program and Partnership Lead at Little Dreamers. Um, first of all, just quickly, I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands on which we gather today. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, any lived experience, both lived and experience of any family and friends impacted by alcohol and drugs in the room today. Um, I was at the lead on this project with support and guidance from Carla Van Mel, our general manager, and Madeline Buckner, our founder and CEO. Um, so who is Little Dreamers? I just thought I'd quickly um, share a little bit of background about Little Dreamers for those of you who may not know. Um, Little Dreamers is a not-for-profit organisation that supports young carers between 4 to 25 years, caring for a family member impacted by chronic illness, disability, drug or alcohol addiction or frail age. With an estimated 1 in 10 young people growing up for caring for a loved one, um, young carers are one of the four most at risk groups um, of young people in our community. Little Dreamers was founded in 2009 um, by our CEO, Madeline Buckner, who grew up caring for her, fam um, for her brother, Charlie, who had encephalitis, and her mother, Lisa, who had breast cancer. When she was 16, Maddie asked the question, who is caring for the carers? A question that led her to establish Little Dreamers. 13 years later, Little Dreamers works to improve the quality of life for young carers ac across Australia delivering fun, empowering and proactive programs. With a team of over 50 staff members, over 60% of our team have lived experience as a carer. Um, this includes myself, caring, um, growing up caring for my sister with mental ill health, addiction and an eating disorder. In the last year, Little Dreamers has seen a 218% increase in applications for support with an increasing number of young carers caring for someone who is affected by alcohol or other drugs. Over the course of this grant peri project period, Little Dreamers established a new program offering via our online Dreamers Hub. The Dreamers Hub is an online peer support program connecting young carers with their peers, providing um, education opportunities, resources and handy tips and tricks. This new program was designed specifically to support young carers caring for someone impacted by AOD. In collaboration with Bobby Cook from Bobby Cook Behaviour Management, we were able to deliver online workshops to young carers, supporting them to learn new tools, strategies and coping mechanisms when caring for someone impacted by AOD. These workshops also helped young carers learn more about addiction and normalise family home environments. This funding also provided Little Dreamers the opportunity to offer specific um, support for young carers impacted by AOD. Um, we also hope to continue this, build, um, this program offering with resources, workshops and forums to support young carers. For the purpose of this evaluation report, as a team we decided to evaluate our school holiday program to determine if the program contributed to improving young carers' quality of life um, and overall social and emotional well-being. The Little Dreamers School Holiday Program provides a respite opportunity for young carers aged 6 to 15 years and aims to enhance participants' health and well-being, social connection and a sense of identity. The program is delivered across the states of Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland and the programs are one-day events um, which feature activities such as canoeing, um, go-karting, cooking, bowling, and it's facilitated by the team to create connections and friendships. Um, we always have lots and lots of fun at these programs. Um, and this theoretically leads to young carers experiencing improved feelings of connection, feeling supported by little dreamers, having an understanding of shared lived experience, caring for someone, and receiving recognition for their caring role. So the key evaluation questions that we address um, the three qu key evaluation questions was, does participation in the school holiday program lead to young carers feeling a sense of community support from Little Dreamers and improved overall wellbeing? Does the program lead to decreased social isolation and increased social connectedness among young carers who support someone who uses AOD? Um, and does it lead to creation of connections with other 
um, young carers who have similar experiences as well as provide positive respite. The evaluation took place from Term 3 holiday period September 2021 through to the beginning of Term 1 Jan 2022. We used a pre-post evaluation design distributing hard copy surveys to young carers between 6 to 15 at the, begin at the beginning of the day. The evaluation was designed to measure the impact of the holiday program across time. And as such, in order for the pre and post evaluation to be effective, it required a young carer to attend the holiday program in September and then have repeat attendance in January. Um, Little Dreamers had initially di uh, distributed 46 overall pre-surveys to participants in attendance at the school holiday program in Queensland and New South Wales. Um, and in regular circumstances, we would expect the majority of these young carers to have repeat attendance. However, much like we've seen today, um, due to the impacts of COVID, we had to cancel um, our January programs in Victoria and New South Wales. Um, alongside other factors outside of our control, remaining program attendance was affected, resulting in um, only five post surveys completed in the area of Bundaberg, Queensland in Jan. Um, Little Dreamers used pre and post surveys at the school holiday programs to identify changes in participants' overall health, well-being, loneliness, engagement, enjoyment and connection across a five-month period. And this design method was chosen to measure the impact of the program on participant well-being and to understand whether any impact was sustained over time. COVID, as we've seen, um, had a significant impact on the delivery of our program, our in-person delivery um, during this evaluation period. And it's highly likely that, um, as we've seen, um, related um, factors to COVID disrupted young carers from attending programs where possible or returning to complete the program twice. This presented a lot of challenges, but of course, um, many learnings throughout this period for Little Dreamers. Um, and it impacted, unfortunately, the sample size that was available for the, for the evaluation. So results um, revealed that um, they're indicative only um, and we plan to collect further data um, to have any statistical com um, confidence in these findings. Um, looking at the available data, findings from this evaluation suggest that young carers who did attend the holiday program reported high levels of confidence in their ability to provide care for their family members impacted by illness, disability or caring for someone impacted by um, drug or alcohol addiction and this confidence was maintained across the two programs across this five-month period. Um, these results support what the organisation has seen for the last 13 years of young carers taking on roles and responsibilities beyond their age to care for someone that they love. Um, as we've seen young carers often growing up do, doing what they need to do to support their family members because it's what they know how to do. So to see the high stable result of young carers' confidence to provide care for their family members um, reinforces the evidence that the organisation often hears from young carers at our programs. Um, overarching themes from the research also identified participants feeling socially connected to other young carers over time. Um, and the research indicated that young carers felt proud of their caring role and were likely to feel comfortable talking about their experiences. Our post survey also revealed that all young carers expressed their strong desire to return to the program and that they had a lot of fun at our programs. Um, the, re the evaluation report has reinforced the need um, for support interventions such as our school holiday program. Um, and it's also, um, Little Dreamers has also implemented plans for professional training for our family support workers to continue to support young carers specifically impacted by AOD. It's also made our team acutely aware of the impact that caring for a family member affected by AOD has on a young person. Um, to deliver and collect data of the evaluation, collaboration with key staff members um, across Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria was essential and the support and um, guidance from CANTA and the Alcohol and Drug Foundation has significantly contributed to little dreamers across this evaluation period. It's also um, signified the importance of continuously modifying, adapting and working together to continue to improve programs where needed to ensure young carers feel safe, recognised and proud to be a young carer across Australia. Thank you.
Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, outside of the school holiday programs, what other programs do you run? Um, we have approximately 11 direct support programs, both online and in person. Um, Little Dreamers works as a bit of a roadmap um, from um, when you can sort of join our programs from the age of four all the way through to 25. So there's programs specifically for um, certain age brackets, which um, all of our programs have different aims, such as um, yeah, creating respite, um, personal development, connections with others. Um, yeah, I guess a couple of <laughs> programs to list a few is our Level Up program for 18 to 25 year olds. That program is all about personal development, um, exploring their identity outside of their caring role um, and helping their next stage of life post school. Um, and another program we have online support such as mentoring and tutoring, um, helping young carers engage in, in um, yeah, extra support outside of school as well. Thanks. I'm lo loving the diversity of the um, services that are on offer. It's just great to see. So our next speaker is from Odyssey. There's two, so Nish Kumar Johnson and Chris Donaldson. Um, supporting an organisation that currently provides support for family members who are often the first responders in the event of an overdose. So welcome. I've just had COVID, so I'm going to probably cough through this whole thing. But we'll see how we go. Hi. Um, we had to come up with an acronym because we work in the drug and alcohol sector. And <laughs> everything we do in the sector is an acronym. So as was FOISP, um, sounded cool at the time. I don't know at a symposium if it still sounds cool. Um, but we, this project was situated in the Information and Support Program, which was formerly the Overdose Prevention Program. So just giving you a bit of context about where we're sitting. Um, I will read this out. Um, Odyssey House Victoria recognises, respects and values Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's histories and cultures and their unique status as custodians and traditional owners of this land and its waters. We acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of Australia as belonging to the oldest continuing culture in human history. We celebrate this. We acknowledge that sovereignty to this land and its waters were never ceded. We remind ourselves of this and walk together in reconciliation. We also acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have suffered profound trauma as a result of Australia's laws and policies. We are sorry for this and commit ourselves to assisting in the healing that is needed. Um, I want to also make an acknowledgement to um, the individual and collective expertise of those with a living or lived experience of drug and alcohol or supporting people with the drug and alcohol issue and recognise their vital contribution at all levels and value the courage of those who share this unique perspective for the purpose of learning, especially for us, and going together to achieve better outcomes for all. All right. Um, really, our intention was to look at our programs and figure out if we could reduce deaths and injuries from overdoses through more effective interventions from family and friends. That was way above our ceiling of accountability. We were not going to get there. But our rationale was that family and friends are often first responders to overdoses. And that need is often a psychological support that is not a common focus for drug and alcohol services. Um, we also knew that people who had access to early intervention had lower um, impacts from their overdoses. So that was really the rationale and intention that we worked on, though this intention lived in there's above the ceiling of accountability. So um, we did an outcome evaluation, but we also did an appropriateness evaluation that was based on co-design. We really wanted to co-design aspects of this project with family and friends. Um, so we did an evaluation on the psychoeducation group and smart recovery group that we ran. We wanted to improve the confidence capabilities and psychological capacity of family and friends of people at risk of overdose. Given that they were responding to overdoses, they were managing overdoses, they were living with the risk of these. We wanted for them to be able to confidently talk about it, to confidently manage and respond to these, um, and also improve their psychological capacity. 
we'll be saying psychological capacity capabilities and confidence a lot through this whole presentation, so we've just called it the three C's. That's what it is. We also wanted to reduce care isolation and fatigue related to overdoses. Given that this was done in the context of COVID, it was bloody hard, um, but it is something we wanted to try to do anyway. Our key evaluation questions um, for the outcome evaluation bit was, does the peer-led support program reduce care of fatigue and isolation relating to overdoses? So that's the psychoeducation program that we ran. And does the psychoeducation group program increase um, the three Cs in relation to responding and managing um, their loved one's risk of overdose? And for the appropriateness, evaluation, we wanted to know what are the support needs of family and friends related to overdoses and what are the elements of a beneficial intervention for family and friends and that was that co-design bit. We used pre and post survey. Um, as many people know, we didn't get, like, no one got much response and neither did we. Um, we used surveys that we built from Oh God, I've forgotten the name now. The Care of Burden Scale, and we retrofitted it to our context. Um, and then we did focus interviews. Given we only had 19 months, oh, sorry, nine months, <laughs> we only had 19 participants. Um, 12 in the outcome evaluations of people who had done the groups, and then seven for the appropriateness evaluation. So people who want to talk to us about their experience and what they needed from the sector. I'll pass over to Chris. That way. Oops. Okay, cool. Um, so the key findings, key findings of the project were that the interventions appear to have positively influenced and increased the, C, the three Cs, as in I know how to respond to this potential overdose, um, psychological capacity, I know what to do, and I have enough wherewithal to deal with this situation, and the perception of participant capability, as in I. I am physically strong enough and know how to get someone into the recovery position, administer naloxone, uh, call an ambulance and get further assistance. Uh, this suggests that the project worked toward the intended outcomes of the psychoeducation group and the adjusted Be Smart Recovery Program for family and friends. Another key finding was that due to COVID restrictions, lockdowns and the increased risk of their loved ones overdose without the access to the professional support participants reported an increase in burden and isolation. These feelings of isolation, fatigue and frustration were expected and participants were also reported, uh, sorry, and participants also reported a potential link between the increase in their burden and fatigue and being the only responders to their loved one's risk of overdose. Yeah. Uh, so increase in participants, this slide shows an increase in the average scores on the overdose response scale post-intervention. This is what we were hoping for. We created the overdose response scale in a way that helped us capture both positive trends and the negative trends. For example, where the post-average score is lower than the pre-average score, we ask questions such as, I don't know how to respond to a loved one's risk of overdose. The change in post-average scores are indicative of an increase in confidence, capacity and capability. Um, which was the intention of the project. Uh, implications. So the implications for the participants were the increased burden of knowledge and increased ability to respond to and manage a loved one's risk of overdose, or the great power behind knowing about risk factors and identification of overdoses, there comes an inherent great responsibility to respond and manage them. The implication of uh, sorry, the implication for the individual clinicians was that we increased our capacity to develop and run an evaluation program such as this for other programs and projects in the future. Uh, the implications for the team we were, were that running an evaluation program online as well as delivering programs remotely impacted on effectiveness um, of the project and, and the team cohesion itself. We also increased our knowledge around the needs of family and friends of people with a risk of overdose. Uh, the learning for the organisation was the amount of staff hours and resources needed to run an evaluation project, whilst workers were also trying to complete their substantive roles. Uh, yeah. Recommendations. So the FOIS team provided three, recommendation, three recommendations. Sorry. 
based on the key findings from the evaluation project. These were the implementation of a blended model of the psychoeducation program and the modified B-Smart recovery program. The continuation of data collection to better inform any service delivery or changes and the creation or amendment of worker roles to intentionally deliver appropriate and ongoing support to family and friends of people at risk of overdose. We recommended a blended model of psychoeducation and the B-SMART program based on the appropriateness evaluation findings from the focus interviews. Additionally, given the small sample size and quick turnaround of the project, we, recommend, we recommended the continuation of data collection in order to better inform interventions with this cohort. Uh, lastly, we recommended a creation or amendment to worker roles based on learnings we gained from the evaluation project. So we set out to increase the three C's of family and friends of people at risk of overdose and evaluate these outcomes. Whilst there is some evidence of the, to this effect, further evidence is needed to inform more robust changes to service creation and delivery. Thank you. been um, monitoring online and we haven't had any questions so that's why we're going to the room a lot. <laughs> that's fine with us. Like this is not even an awkward thing. This is okay. <laughs> My question relates to um, the um, decision to roll naloxone out more, to, ma to make naloxone more freely available to people across Australia. Uh, ta through take-home naloxone and whether this really, what your thoughts are around what this might mean for support for people, family and friends with alongside that sort of um, policy change and program. Um, I think as most people have said here, people often contact services when there's a crisis and I think in that moment when people need naloxone or they need to talk or whatever is too late. And I think in terms of the take home naloxone, it would be great if every single person had naloxone in their house, just as every person who needs to have an EpiPen has an EpiPen in their house, you know, and I think that might make it easier. But that's not to say just because there's a policy change, there is a practice change, right? There is still stigma, as we've heard across the day. There is still burden, as we've heard across the day, to carry naloxone. Um, and I think, yeah, so whilst that might make it easier to get and retain naloxone and for us to give out naloxone, and I think it's the using of it that you know is important. And I, I, I don't know how the policy change will impact on the actual practical reality of the situation. I think it's a great example of um, let's think about how we implement policy when we make decisions and clearly the support for family and friends is really critical in that thinking. So our um, next speaker or two again, our Kelly Foy and Karen Ralph from Uniting AOD and Mental Health. Um, they're going to be talking about supporting a family support service that offers single session family consultation to collect information such as client satisfaction with service, client improved knowledge of AOD AOD issues and related data. So welcome Kelly and Karen. Thank you. Um, my name's Karen. I'm the manager of catchment clinical services at Uniting AOD. And my name is Kelly and I am the family AOD clinician at Uniting. And we'd also like to acknowledge our co-worker, Liz Steen, who did take part in the evaluation with us but uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, I'd also like to start by acknowledging that we are on First Nations people's lands and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, and acknowledge any First Nations people in the room. Thank you. Um, so our family programs and family services or family counselling started in 2005. Thank you. And our single session family work, although we discussed it a lot during 2008 and 2009, was implemented in 2010. 
The service is statewide and it's delivered in all modalities. So now we do face-to-face -face telehealth or telephone, depending on what the family wants and, of course, what the family um, is able to get to as well, being a statewide service. Uh, the family counselling is delivered by Kelly, who is our one and only family counsellor. We would like to grow that program. And our single sessions are actually facilitated by each of our clinicians. We are really fortunate at Uniting AOD that we have one of our managers, Sarah Jones, who is a family therapist who's worked at Bouverie and has worked at 360 Edge in training. And so she has a capability of training up all of our catchment clinical staff to provide single session family work, which means that we can be really proactive and timely in our response to families. Uh, referrals are received through our intake services. They may also be received through some of our other clinicians who are seeing service users at the time. One thing when we introduced family services to our programs that we really wanted to make sure is that we didn't actually have to have, or a family didn't have to have a person who was using substances actively seeking treatment to be able to service the families. Because what we understood and what we found out is that servicing and pro providing support for families led to those people that are using substances often getting support as well. Next. Um, as you can see, our key evaluation, I won't go through what the questions are up on the stage. It was basically based around our theory of change that families engaged in single session family work and family counselling experience a better, better quality of life. Now, as you can understand, quality of life is um, a huge task or, you know, to uh, achieve. So what we did was we broke it down into two elements being well-being and the improvement in family members' well-being and also uh, an improvement in their ability to cope with their loved one's substance use. Okay, so for this project, we collected data using pre and post questionnaires, which also included the Warwick Edinburgh our mental wellbeing scale and an interview conducted four months post program for all 15 members to measure the impacts of both single session family work and family counselling on families' wellbeing and ability to cope. The pre and post questionnaires provided valuable quantitative data highlighting the positive statistical significance, and I said it without stumbling, yay, <laughs> uh, for families engaging in single session family work and family counselling, with an overall 10% improvement in all areas of wellbeing and ability to co cope. Sorry. Uh, qualitative data from interviews provided a more colourful and complex picture of the impacts of problematic substance use on the family and the learnings and tools they now use um, in supporting themselves and supporting their loved ones. Uh, overall, we found that families' engagement with single session family work and family counselling reduced the impact on wellbeing and saw an increase in the ability to cope with a loved one's substance use. Okay, so we know that for some families being a part of the single session family um, counselling programs and the single session family work programs were often the first time that families were able to talk about their experiences. Um, and some of the things that were commonly explored in those sessions were the impacts on the family as a unit, uh, relationships and dynamics, physical and emotional stress, ways to effectively communicate, boundary setting, um, supporting families to give themselves permission to engage in self-care and safety. Uh, so during interviews, families stated that engaging in these programs allowed them to reflect on their current situation and develop strategies and tools to better manage and cope, allowing them the capacity to support themselves and their person in a more effective way. Families remarked, it's also about my life and how I manage the journey and feeling safer because they felt more in control. This led to the development of improved wellbeing, with family members stating, I am better able to set boundaries. Uh, the way I deal with it has changed, not seeing it as selfish but looking after myself. Uh, I know that lapse and relapse is a process and learnt not to be or to let go of my responsibility in that space, and I'm spending less time on the worry part. Um, reflections such as, we are in an episode of relapse now, it's been challenging but we've changed the dance. Uh, and I'm better able to protect myself and have a better understanding of the patterns he might go through, continue highlighting the ongoing development in a family's ability to cope. 
Right. So what we recognised throughout our interviews using the Warwick and Scale is that it, we felt it was kind of broken up into elements of wellbeing and ability to cope. And so, as you can see, the themes, uh, themes emerging related to sort of wellbeing was uh, improved mental health, health impacts on the person using substances, personal stress and distress was improved, and levels of anxiety was also improved. What we recognised is that those themes of wellbeing then clearly impacted also the ability to cope, so coping skills, boundary setting, lapse and relapse, detox and rehab, and just having access to information as well. And it's a bit of a chicken or the egg. You know, we asked families, you know, is it improved wellbeing that led into your, uh, you know, better ability to cope or vice versa? And they really couldn't name which one that was. So what we recognise, though, very simply, is that an improvement in one led to an improvement in other, which then led to an improvement either way. So there was, like I said, Kelly said there was a 10 per cent increase over that four-month period of time. So we kind of just imagine what that could be if we were able to provide families further ongoing support as well. Okay, so the evidence, both quantitative and qualitative, demonstrated that engagement in either single session family work or family counselling improved a family's ability to cope with a loved one's substance use and improved their well-being, leading to a better quality of life. However, we also recognise that how families participated in the pre and post questionnaires and surveys were directly influenced on how their loved one was managing their substance use at the time. Uh, with ongoing support in the family counselling program, data revealed that a family's confidence in coping with their loved one's substance use and improvement in their own well-being significantly increased effective outcomes for the family. All participants found AOD clinicians to be non-judgmental, um, empathetic and patient, and supported families to better understand AOD and explore the tools and strategies they would use, um, or they use, sorry, more to more effectively support their ability to cope with their loved one's substance use. Uh, we know that single session and family counselling make a really big difference for families. However, this data project was not only able to provide an opportunity to gather and present concrete evidence of the significant statistical improvement for families who engage in uniting single session family work and family counselling programs, uh, but highlights the reasons why programs for families need to continue having an important and integral presence in the AOD space. Um, so finally, recommendations that are not um, particularly mind-blowing, I suppose, to people in this room. Um, we would like to continue to use the Warwick Edinburgh scale um, to continue to evaluate our programs, you know, continue off a single session family work because it is uh, timely practice. And we noticed that the improvement just with one session for families being heard was significant as well. We want to continue to collect data, continue to have our staff have an opportunity to train in single session family work and also, of course, you know, what everyone needs, uh, access to funding. So, because what we understand is that we started family work in 2005, and we know that the world of AOD has changed for families. You know, so not only has access to information changed, access to substances has changed, substance use itself has changed, and our idea of what a family is has also changed. So we need to make sure we continue to evaluate these programs so we make sure we're getting responsive, up-to-date, evidence-based treatment to provide to our families because the AOD world is changing so significantly. And we know, as can be seen in this quote here, that treatment for families is treatment for the person using substances and their outcomes are then so much better. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. I've got um, something that, that piqued my interest in that was the relapse lapse conversations and the importance of a family member's understanding what relapse is and what it means. How significant do you think that little tiny piece of information has in terms of the real impact on, on the family member's understanding of the person that um, is using alcohol or drugs? Um, I suppose how long's a piece of string is probably the answer because it's significant. You know, I don't know that we could put a number on that. On that. Um, and I think we recognise that across all of our services. So we have people that come into our withdrawal services, are there for a week, a family member comes in to visit and they expect this significant change at the end of that treatment only in seven days of what might have been a five year, 10 year, 15 year kind of problematic substance use. So it's, it's significant for the family member because the person using substances knows that that might happen and knows 
knows, we know that it's a commonly uh, you know, relapsing preventing, you know, relapsing condition as well. So I think that education is extremely important. And one of the quotes I think says, you know, we're able to change the dance. And that's what families I think recognise when they learn that, that there will be some back and forth and that's just to kind of be expected. But it doesn't mean that that person themselves has kind of gone backwards as well. So yeah, really, really significant. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I did have a question regarding the single session uh, method. Mm -hmm. So if a family comes in and does a single session and they want more support, is there sort of other alternative pathways that you can kind of refer them within the service? There is. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so absolutely. So when a family accesses our service through intake, it's almost like an assessment for families, a single session family space. So in that, in that session, you're able to unpack what type of supports that the families are needing and then looking at all of the different supports that are available. So within our service, we have the family counselling team, which is me, um, and also we have supported playgroups for um, families who are impact, impacted or impacted by um, their own or somebody else's substance use. Um, we have the FRO team, but we also have the external organisations that we work really closely with, such as um, Family Drug Help with um, the In Focus program, the Breakthrough programs, and also, you know, sort of handballing some of those other family counselling uh, referrals if we don't have capacity to other organisations in and around our space. Thank you. Thank you.